Hey, acting class, I'm going to start a series of talks about different kinds of acting techniques. So today, number one, we're going to talk about the big man, Stanislavski. <laughs> now you've heard about Stanislavski and the method capital letter method. And I'm just gonna talk and explain a little bit about the technique and where it's from, okay? So here we go. The Stanislavski system is a systemic approach to training actors that the Russian theater practitioner, Konstantin Stanislavski, developed in the first half of the 20th century. His system cultivates what he calls the art of experiencing with which he contrasts the art of representation. It mobilizes the actor's conscious thought and will in order to activate other less controllable psychological processes such as emotional experience and subconscious behavior, sympathetically and indirectly. In rehearsal, the actor searches for inner motivations to justify action and the definition of what the character seeks to achieve at any given moment, whatever task they're, they're working for. Now, that's a very complicated way of saying it's hard to just cry when a director asks you, I'd like to see some tears here, you know, or I'd like to see you scream in anger here. Sometimes the emotion is hard to find. And so an actor is left representing the feeling rather than actually feeling it. Now, depending on the size of the theater, that's very important because if it's a very small theater, they're gonna see that you're kind of just faking it. You know, if it's a very big theater, they may not be able to see that. So in Stanislavski's method, he would try to get the actor to develop their art of experiencing life. So with outside of rehearsal, outside in your life, observation, experiencing, and paying attention. So all those uncomfortable feelings you have, the anger, the crying, the, the things that people don't like to show because we don't like to show our vulnerability, he would say, pay attention. In those moments, pay attention. How did you feel? Where did it start? Where did the tears start? In your eyes, in your nose? Uh, sometimes it starts in pressure on your heart, on your chest. Pay attention so that in the art of experiencing it, you can recreate it when you have to on stage and it will be real. It'll be based in something real. He felt that the art of representation was what was going on at the time. So his technique, the method, um, and I say it like that because it's not the method. It's not a method of acting. He actually capitalized the M and that is the title of that technique. Um, he felt that people could, <laughs> they could show it, they could represent it, but a little campy, a little over the top, maybe. Sometimes maybe so small, the audience couldn't see it. And when they were representing it, they couldn't actually make the audience connect and make them believe. And so he developed an entire method of acting centered around a psychological approach to acting. Um, Stanislavski later on, he further elaborated that system with a more physically grounded rehearsal process that came to be known as the method of physical action. Minimizing at the table discussions, he now encouraged an active representation in which the sequence of dramatic situations are improvised. The best analysis of a play, Stanislavski argued, is to take action in the given circumstances. So not to get stuck on the words, but how do you move through? How do you physically respond? So the uh, at the table discussions, those that's what happens on the first rehearsal. People sit around at a table 
and they read through the script and they discuss the characters and the relationships. So he wanted to do less of that and more of actually getting up on your feet, even if it meant holding the script and trying to physically move through the lines and the feelings of the circumstances that were present in the script. Even if it meant you were going to paraphrase a little bit, or even if it meant that you dropped a line or skipped a line or said someone else's line by mistake, he thought it was more important to get up and have a method of physical action. Thanks to its promotion and development by acting teachers who were former students on the whole, the many translations of Stanislavski's theoretical writing, his system acquired an unprecedented ability to cross cultural boundaries and developed a reach, dominating debates about acting in the West. So Stanislavski's ideas then came to America. They became accepted as common sense so that actors may use them without actually knowing what it is they're doing. Many actors routinely equate his system with the American method, although the Russian method of Stanislavski's work is quite different and much more disciplined. The American method is much more uh, flexible, uh, let's say. I was going to say floppy, but that sounds judge judgy. Um, the American method is much more uh, how do you as an individual experience it as opposed to a standard that you should follow to build your skills. Um, the American method psychological techniques contrast sharply with the multivariate holistic and psych psychophysical approach of the system which explores character and action both from the inside out and the outside in and treats the actor's mind and body as parts of a continuum, very holistic. In response to his characterization work on Argonne in Moliere's The Imaginary Invalid in 1913, he was a director as well, Stanislavski concluded that a character is sometimes formed psychologically, that means like from the inside, from the inner image of the role, but at other times, it's discovered just through pure exploration from the outside. In fact, Stanislavski found that many of his students who were method acting were having mental problems and instead encouraged his students to shake off the character after rehearsing. Um, this has often been misused in American acting in that you're supposed to stay in character from the moment you get in character backstage, you're supposed to stay in that character until the end of the show. Well, nobody wants to see the character take a bow. They want to see the actor behind the character take a bow. Nobody wants to live with Iago. <laughs> nobody wants to live with Othello. So those characters being alive on stage is, is immaculate. But if you cannot take the mask of the character off and find out who you are and act as you are, you could lead yourself right into some, some serious mental illness, mental problems where you've lost your own identity in the identity of the character. So it's interesting because a lot of times people will say that Stanislavski's method was purely psychological, purely from the inside out. Uh, musical comedy people will joke that it's the remember your dead dog when you were three so that you can cry technique. Um, and I have actually worked with some people who use this technique and were kind of dangerous backstage. Did a sh uh, production of Three Penny Opera in which I played one of the chorus, just a beggar. And the guy who played Mr. Peachin, who was supposed to be in charge of all the beggars, stayed in character backstage, which meant if I was standing or sitting in the wings off stage and he walked by, he might try to kick me or push me out of the way or treat me the way he would treat me on stage. This made him a little shaky backstage and people were concerned uh, about how comfortable they were being with him when he wasn't in scene 
saying dialogues. So in Stanislavski's own words, he did believe there was an inside out, a psychological aspect, but that the holistic part of it was the physical part, and that would be an outside in way. So by moving about the room and using uh, the motions of the character, that might help you explore and find the character as well. So you'd need both halves. You need the inner creation of the character, but you also need the outer part of just physically doing it. Just get up on your feet and give it a try. Throughout his career, Stanislavski subjected his acting and direction to a rigorous process of artistic self-analysis and reflection. His system of acting developed out of his persistent efforts to remove the blocks that he encountered in his own performances, beginning with a major crisis in 1906. Having worked as an amateur actor and director until the age of 33, in 1898, yes, the technique is that old, in 1898, Stanislavski co-founded with Vladimir Nemirovich Denchenko the Moscow Art Theater, or MAT, M-A-T, Moscow Art Theater, and began his professional career. The two of them were resolved to institute a revolution in the staging practices of the time. Benedetti offers a vivid portrait of the poor quality of mainstream theatrical practice in Russian before the MAT, the MAT. The script at that time meant less than nothing. Sometimes the cast did not even bother to learn their lines. Leading actors would simply plant themselves downstage center by the prompter's box and wait to be fed the lines, then deliver them straight out to the audience in a ringing voice, giving a fine display of passion and temperament. Everyone, in fact, spoke their lines out front, straight out. Direct communication with the other actors, minimal. Furniture was often arranged and the sets were designed to allow the actors to face front. Part of that is because they didn't have microphones. So the best way to get projection and allow the audience to hear what you were saying was to face front. Stanislavski's early productions were created without the use of his system. His first international successes were staged using an external director-centered technique that strove for an organic unity of all its elements. In other words, in each production, he planned the interpretation of every role. He would decide what the blocking was, when you enter, when you exit, where, where you look, and the mise-en-scene. That means the shape of each of the scenes in detail and in advance. He also introduced into the production process a period of discussion and detailed analysis of the play by the cast. Despite the success that this approach brought, particularly with his naturalistic approach to stagings of the plays of Anton Chekhov and Maxim Gorky, Stanislavski felt kind of dissatisfied by this approach. Now, I know I, as a director, because I'm working in two languages, frankly, with, you know, frankly, with deaf and hearing at the same time, I almost always have everything totally planned out I have a gloss for the ASL so that there's an overall consistency to the translation. Uh, I tend to be ready to feed the actors absolutely everything if they need it. But this is because I work with student actors at a college level in a place where a lot of these actors don't have a lot of training. They may even have a lot of experience from high school or community theater but they don't actually know how they do what they do. So I try to give them that safety net. But I can tell you, when I get the chance to work with an actor who already is trained and they know what they're doing, and all I have to do is shape the piece because they come in already with a beautiful translation, they come in already knowing the character, knowing the relationships. I may disagree with them. We may have discussions about that and, and deepen it, but there's something to start with. Now, if you're a writer, you understand how this works because if you're sitting and you're looking at a blank piece of paper, when you go to write, a lot of times you get writer's block. As a director, if you walk into rehearsal, half the people aren't there, no one's memorized, they're all waiting for you to tell them exactly what to do, when to breathe, when to move, when to sit, when to stand, 
It can be a bit overwhelming and it feels a little like you're creating on a blank sheet of paper until you get a few actors in who know to come to rehearsal already prepared. Some of them may even come already memorized so they don't have to deal with the book in their hands. That is golden to a director's point of view, let me tell you. So both, uh, we're going back to Stanislavski, both his struggles with Chekhov's drama, out of which his notion of subtext emerged. This is crucial for an actor. Subtext is what you get to make up, why you say what you say. And his experiments with symbolism encouraged a greater attention to interaction and a more intensive investigation of the actor's process, a much more psychological emphasis. He began to develop the more actor-centered techniques of psychological realism, and his focus shifted from his productions to rehearsal process, and then shifted to pedagogy, to teaching. He pioneered the use of theater studios as laboratories in which to innovate actor training and to experiment with new forms of theater. So for example, when you join the drama club or the RIT players, or you join a group like dangerous signs and you start to experiment with each other there's a social aspect to it you start to develop things that is prime training ground because in there you start to find your own approach to acting and you also find your own tools the things that you know almost always work for you now the next step would then be, of course, go to a rehearsal process with a director who can shape and move and give you new ideas to add to the tools that you've created. And the last, of course, would be the production in which the audience feedback would let you know if it's working or not and what should change or what shouldn't change. (laughs) You know, in, in, in Russia, at that time, now it's 1898, it's a crazy long time ago. You had an entire discussion about the art of theater and they were very concerned about how it was becoming frozen and a little, you know, indicative. It wasn't, the actors were indicating they weren't really feeling it, which meant that the audience couldn't really feel it. And they were afraid as everyone has been afraid in every year that it would be the end of theater, it would be the death of theater, which of course theater is a very, very strong, flexible art and it adjusts to each generation beautifully. Um, But in Stanislavski's era, they took all of this very, very seriously and Gorky with Vakantov and other members of the first studio an institution devoted to research and pedagogy, which emphasized experimentation, improvisation, and self-discovery, they had a range, they had a spectrum of where they would go in this technique. So it wasn't all what we think of now as Stanislavski's The Method, in which you have to have experienced something before you can present it on stage. Um, and in fact, other people that we're going to be talking about, Uta Hagen, Stella Adler, they believed you don't have to experience being a cat to be in the show Cats. You need to have strong observational skills and a good imagination, but you don't necessarily have to have experienced murdering someone to portray a murderer. That imagination played a part in there. Stanislavski did not deal with the imagination. He dealt with psychological, internal, and physical action, external. Stanislavski eventually came to organize his techniques into a coherent systemic methodology, which built on three major strands of influence. The director-centered, unified, aesthetic, and disciplined ensemble approach, which he used in the mine engine company to the actor centered. So you have director centered to the actor centered realism of the Malai different theater and three, the naturalistic staging of Antoine and the independent theater movement. So you have director, I'm going to tell you from the outside and you make it work 
That's one. Or two, the actor comes in and says, well, I feel I should move this way. Or three, you have a naturalistic staging in which there's a discussion and a collaboration between internal and external. Um, Stanislavski's earliest reference to his system appears in 1909, long time ago, over 100 years ago. That same year, that was when he first incorporated it into his rehearsal process. Olga Nipper and many of the other Moscow art theater actors in that production, Ivan Turgenev's comedy, A Month in the Country, resented Stanislavski's use of using the production as a laboratory into which to conduct his experiments on acting. But they all became famous from it. It definitely changed the more formalistic and much more structured approach to acting uh, that had been going on before. And that structured acting was based in a physical representational technique. So if the director left you alone, you went downstage center because that was the best place to be seen and heard. If they only left you alone a little bit, you'd move to downstage center left because from the audience's point of view, we read left to right. So that would be a, a stronger place to be. If the director moved you, you moved yourself, but then you felt empowered to add external gestures that were supposed to support what it was that you were saying in the text. These gestures may not have felt organic. They may not even have looked like anything you'd really see uh, on the street or in, in interactions in real life, but they were big and they were broad and in a large theater they could be seen easily. And the audience started to understand the code of those movements. They started to understand what they were supposed to represent, even if they weren't naturalistic movements. Um, by 1911, that is when Stanislavski really, really used his system as its official rehearsal schedule, uh, rehearsal method for the Moscow Arts Theater. Once the Moscow Arts Theater, the MAD had accepted Stanislavski's techniques, then it started to spread as an accepted alternative to the sorts of, of acting and rehearsal process and production process that had been going on. It came across the pond and became an American version of Stanislavski's The Method and is still taught today as the main way of training young actors, which I find kind of backward. <laughs> it's well over a hundred years, no concept of technology, no concept of how we actually interact in real life now is actually in this, this method. And you'll see as we talk about the methods that follow, nearly everyone was responding to Stanislavski's method. He responded to a much more formalistic representational style of acting. He was trying to get it to seem more natural. Uh, his methods now do not feel so natural anymore. So as we go on from 1911 into 2021, we're going to see a lot of different approaches and changes to how people feel uh, an actor could be or should be trained in order to be fully ready to approach and embrace a character and to find success on the stage. So we'll continue to talk about that and I'll bring up the next one soon. Okay. Enjoy. Think about it. Look into it. Okay. Bye.